Nice work. What are they doing? Anything? Are they doing anything? No. Okay, we don't I need to start off. Subcommittee on Regulatory Reform, Commercial and Antitrust Law will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. We welcome everyone to today's oversight hearing for the Antitrust Enforcement Agencies. Federal Trade Commission's Bureau of Competition and the Department of Justice Antitrust Division, and I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Welcome to this hearing with the Federal Trade Commission's Bureau of Competition and the Department of Justice Antitrust Division, the agencies that help consumers by protecting the free market. There is a broad scope of issues to cover and this hearing comes to a vital time for many issues important to the American public. Americans are concerned about the high cost of prescription drugs. One way to address those costs is to ensure the robust competition in the pharmaceuticals market. Ranking member Cicilline and I introduced legislation to do just that. The Food and Drug Administration restricts the distribution of certain pharmaceuticals for public safety reasons. Unfortunately, these restricted distribution programs known as risk evaluation and mitigation strategies or REMS processes can be abused. They can be used as a pretext for branded manufacturers to deny generic manufacturers access to needed samples for testing, thereby delaying generic entry into the market. This can keep prescription drug prices artificially high. Data shows that generic competition can reduce the price of branded drugs by more than 85%. Even if the FDA does not require a REMS process for a drug, the manufacturer can voluntarily restrict distribution through contracts with distributors or specialized pharmacies that creates Act would ensure that generic manufacturers get access to samples so they can get to the market. The bill would allow generics to sue branded manufacturers to obtain an injunction requiring them to provide the needed samples. The FTC has provided substantial technical assistance to the committee in support of this important bipartisan effort, and we are grateful for their helpful feedback. I look forward to hearing from Commissioner Simons about why passing this bill should be a priority. We would love to deliver this win for consumers before the end of this year. Another area of interest is DOJ's pending review of antitrust consent decrees, including two long-standing consent decrees governing music licensing. The antitrust division is currently reviewing all of its consent decrees to reduce the amount of ongoing government regulation of otherwise private markets. While I applaud the DOJ and Assistant Attorney General Del Rahim, efforts reviewing antitrust consent degrees, I am concerned of negative effects to the music industry if those consent degrees are terminated, and I'll repeat that, if they are terminated without an alternative in place. 
it is logistically difficult for music buyers to identify all the rights owners for millions of songs, each with multiple copyright holders. Accordingly, performance rights organization or pros were developed long ago to bundle composition licenses and sell them to music buyers at blanket rates. Under modern antitrust analysis, such coordination might be justifiable under the Supreme Court's, I quote, rule of reason, end quote, if efficiencies increase consumer welfare. However, in the early part of the 20th century, the government considered its pro se illegal. In 1941, DOJ sued the first pros, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, ASCAP, and Broadcast Music Incorporated, BMI. The two pros entered into a consent decree still in existence today that allowed them to operate but impose conditions designed to prevent abuse. These conditions included non-discrimination provisions and the institution of a rate court to set fees in cases in which the parties could not agree. Music buyers, however, are concerned that precipitously eliminating the consent decrees without an alternative in place could create chaos. The recently enacted Music Modernization Act, MMA, contains a provision requiring DOJ to notify Congress before seeking the termination of the music decrees. I would like Mr. Delarang to tell us what specifically he believes his obligations are under this new law and his vision for the future of the music consent decrees. I am also concerned that foreign countries may be misusing competition law to disadvantage American companies. Recent reports have identified problems, including a lack of due process and a failure to protect intellectual property rights in areas such as technology and pharmaceuticals. I would like to hear from our witnesses on how we can ensure American businesses do not get taken advantage of. There are many other issues to discuss that and I and other committee members will bring up in our questions. I thank the witnesses for appearing and look forward to hearing from them today. And before I turn the microphone over to my good friend here, I wanna thank David, my good friend, David Cicilline, for the ranking member that he has been. We've put legislation together, uh, put good legislation together, gotten it across the finish line. We're hoping that we can get one or two more done. And it's been an honor and a privilege working with him, and I thank him very much. Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Cicilline. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I begin my remarks, I too want to take a moment to say that it has been a pleasure working with you as chairman of this subcommittee. I very much appreciate your friendship and the opportunity to work with you and look forward to continuing our work together. I'm particularly proud of our work to make drug prices and health care more affordable through uh, the full benefits of competition. So thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I, I strongly believe that we should build on this bipartisan record to improve people's lives by lowering health care costs, improving economic opportunity, and conducting robust oversight of the antitrust laws to ensure that our economy is working for everyone. I sincerely look forward to continuing this important work with you and my other colleagues on the committee next year. Turning to the subject of today's hearing, it's clear to me that we are in a monopoly moment and our nation's antitrust enforcers are at the front lines of addressing this economic crisis. Whether it's persistently high corporate profits, the rise of economic concentration and market power in numerous sectors of the economy, or the widespread feeling of economic powerlessness, too many Americans know that our economy is not working for them. They feel it in, a, in every flat paycheck, in the skyrocketing cost of health care and prescription drugs, and in a fundamental belief that our economy only works for the powerful special interests and the mega wealthy. They may not use the word unilateral effects or monopsony, but Americans across the political spectrum know that what we need to restore our competition system to its full potential. And in addition to higher prices, lower incomes, fewer choices, and less jobs, it's obvious to working Americans that consolidation is a fundamental threat to our political freedom as well. Powerful companies have the ability and incentive to influence legislative and regulatory outcomes in their favor, fortifying their dominance by decreasing the risk of scrutiny, oversight, or accountability. 
And when this outsized political power is coupled with non-existent campaign finance rules and toothless transparency requirements for political spending, it opens the floodgates for corporate special interests to spend unlimited amounts of secret money at every level of the policymaking process to capture our democracy. As Professor Tim Wu recently explained, the curse of bigness is not just the creeping inefficiency of sprawling firms. It's that as businesses get larger, it begins to enjoy a different kind of advantages, having less to do with efficiencies of operation and more to do with its ability to wield economic and political power by itself or in conjunction with others. Last month's disturbing reports of Facebook's conduct in the aftermath of the 2016 election and the Cambridge Analytica scandal are a stark reminder of this reality. But it's not just one company. We have a system-wide problem that requires a top-to-bottom investigation. With this in mind, today's hearing is an important opportunity to interrogate the state of our competition system. Is it living up to its full potential? Have the broad legislative goals of the antitrust laws been narrowed by the courts? Do the agencies have the resources and tools that they need to do their job? And should a company be functionally allowed to break the law twice before being held accountable? As Chairman Emanuel Seller used to say, and I quote, the purpose of our antitrust laws is to prevent unhealthy concentration of American business, end quote. And as I've said before, our laws are not recommendations. It's vital that we ask if our enforcers are fully equipped to do their job, question whether current enforcement is working, and take corrective steps to ensure that our laws are working as designed. With that, I thank both of our witnesses today. I know you both care deeply about these questions and want to get this right as much as I do. I look forward to working with you and my Republican colleagues on this extremely important matter in the months ahead. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, David. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the full Judiciary Committee, Congressman Goodlatte of Virginia, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding this antitrust enforcement oversight hearing. There is so much to discuss. The average U.S. household spends over $2,000 a year on gasoline. That might be one thing if fuel prices were set by the free market, but they are not. Instead, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, colludes to fix prices. It's estimated that OPEC's cartel behavior currently costs U.S. consumers as much as an extra $250 billion per year. That's about $750 per consumer. Or $3,000 for a family of four. The fact that OPEC is not being held accountable for its anti-competitive behavior makes a mockery of U.S. antitrust law. The No Oil Producing and Exporting Cartels Act of 2018, or NOPEC, explicitly authorizes the Department of Justice to bring lawsuits in federal court against nations that engage in conduct designed to fix the price of oil. It passed the committee in June by a voice vote. OPEC just cut supplies at its December meeting to prop up prices yet again. That is the last thing Americans need around the holidays. I would like the administration's support for this bill so we can deliver a bipartisan victory before this term of Congress ends. Another major concern for U.S. households is the rising cost of prescription drugs. Pharmacy benefit managers, or PBMs, act as buying intermediaries between drug manufacturers and health plans. Three pharmacy benefit managers, PBMs, control 85 percent of the market. A 2018 report by the White House Council of Economic Advisors found that because of market consolidation, PBMs, quote, exercise undue market power, generating outsized profits, end quote. Because pricing and rebate terms are kept secret, the system, quote, encourages manufacturers to set artificially high list prices, which are reduced via manufacturer's rebates, but leave uninsured individuals facing high drug prices." End quote. The independent pharmacies in my district have raised significant concerns about PBM business practices. These include gag clauses that prohibit pharmacies from guiding patients to cheaper alternatives, exclusionary tactics that advantage PBM-owned mail-order pharmacies, and opaque and effectively non-negotiable contract terms that result in skyrocketing penalties known as direct and indirect remuneration fees. The FTC has previously stated that PBMs help lower prices by aggregating demand, which increases negotiating power. However, a recent analysis comparing Medicaid drug spending with actual acquisition costs determined that the savings are not consistently passed on due to OPEC PBM pricing practices. In fact, 
In one representative example, Medicaid was paying nine times the acquisition cost of a heavily prescribed drug. Recent vertical mergers in the PBM market offer a springboard for broader study of these issues. Market power in the tech sector is another focus. Both witnesses have recently suggested that there are valid concerns about competition in the tech sector. In September, a lawyer for a former Google engineer testified before the committee about, quote, anti-conservative discrimination, harassment, and institutionalized bias faced by many conservative Americans at the hands of large technology companies, end quote. She provided numerous and startling examples, including an employee fired after stating that, quote, Trump supporters are a hated and despised minority at Google, end quote, and pleading for better treatment. A recent Wall Street Journal article noted that Google workers discussed tweaking Google's search function to counter President Trump's travel ban. This particular plan was not implemented, but together with the hostile environment stories, they suggest both motive and opportunity. Some are tempted to fight such developments by declaring tech platforms public squares and regulating them. A better path would be to explore whether more effective competition in the tech sector would provide the cure. Relatedly, there is a movement afoot to replace antitrust law's consumer welfare standard with alternatives that encompass broader social welfare goals. I am skeptical of moving away from objective empirical economic analysis under the consumer welfare standard towards analysis under malleable and subjective social welfare standards that can be manipulated to suit regulators' political or ideological goals. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on these matters and other issues of importance within their jurisdiction. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. The chair recognizes the ranking member of the full Judiciary Committee, Congressman Nadler of New York, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening today's oversight hearing of the antitrust agencies and our competition system. This hearing occurs at a critical moment. Over the past several decades, waves of anti-competitive consolidation in industry after industry, which has largely been the result of lax merger enforcement, have threatened the economic well-being and financial security of American families. Whether through job losses and artificially low wages, or higher prices and lower quality for essential goods and services, this massive concentration of economic power has arguably even frayed our nation's social fabric. Unfortunately, this trend towards greater consolidation shows little sign of abating. There has been $10 trillion in merger activity in recent years, with a record $2.5 trillion in mergers announced in the first half of 2018 alone. As Bill Baer, then Assistant Attorney General of the Antitrust Division, testified two years ago, there has been an upswing in extremely large, complex, and blatantly anti-competitive transactions that, quote, never should have made it out of the boardroom, close quote. Some recent administrations have seemingly welcomed this development, but even those with a genuine desire to restrain such threats to competition have been forced to expend significant resources to challenge mega mergers that have clear anti-competitive effects. For too long, however, funding for enforcement has been flat, severely limiting the ability of regulators to bring enforcement proceedings. At the same time, courts are requiring immensely demanding evidentiary showings to prove the obvious further opening the floodgates to anti-competitive mergers. As a result of this increasing concentration of economic power, American consumers pay more for essential goods and services, such as food, clothing, health care, and prescription drugs, while corporations earn persistently high profits that pay for astronomical executive salaries rather than higher wages or better jobs for hardworking Americans. The decline in enforcement over the last several decades has also been an economic catastrophe for millions of workers. Some have lost their jobs due to the supposed efficiencies, in quotes, of anti-competitive mergers. And many face lower wages and less opportunity due to wage fixing or anti other anti-competitive conduct by employers, all of which has been enabled by regulators. While ultimately it is the responsibility of the antitrust enforcement agencies to enforce the law fully and properly, the House Judiciary Committee has an obligation to conduct meaningful oversight to ensure such proper enforcement to provide additional enforcement resources and, when necessary, to consider changes to the antitrust laws. Dating back to Chairman Emanuel Sellers' establishment of the Subcommittee on the Study of Monopoly Power in 1949, which I would add 
was staffed by a young antitrust attorney from Chicago named John Paul Stevens, who would later serve with distinction as an Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. This committee has conducted investigations into anti-competitive conduct by dominant firms, amended the antitrust laws to address the rising tide of economic concentration, and explored policies to promote competition in markets that are highly concentrated. But in recent decades, Congress has acquiesced to the erosion of the antitrust laws by pro-big business administrations and by federal court decisions that have made the antitrust laws more technical and more narrowly focused on economic efficiencies for businesses than on the broader economic and social policy goals that had previously animated antitrust law. Compounding Congress's negligence have been its deliberate decisions to paralyze enforcers and regulators through meager appropriations and structural limitations on rulemaking. I strongly believe it is time to turn the page on this history of neglect, and I look forward to working with the agencies to ensure that competition is vibrant and that working Americans enjoy the full benefits of open and fully competitive markets. Before closing, I also want to touch on a particular issue that is of bipartisan importance to the Committee and to the Congress. This year, I worked with Chairman Goodlatte and my other colleagues on this committee to enact the Music Modernization Act, an historic effort to address longstanding inequities in the music marketplace and to ensure that songwriters and other music creators receive fair market value for their work. It is very important to me that this law, which was strongly supported by virtually all stakeholders, which passed the House 415 to nothing and the Senate by unanimous consent, is not undermined by abrupt changes in enforcement policy with respect to the ASCAP and BMI consent decrees that could, that could disrupt benefits to songwriters, copyright owners, music licensees, and consumers, particularly without an alternative framework in place. With that, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and I'm working together on these important matters going forward. I yield back. Without objection, other members' opening statements will be made part of the record. I will begin by swearing in our witnesses before introducing them. Would you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you swear that the testimony that you are about to give before this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have uh, responded in the affirmative, and please make yourself at home. I'm going to introduce both of you before asking you to uh, give us your opening statements, if you don't mind that. Mr. Rahim was confirmed on September 27, 2017 as Assistant Attorney General for the Antitrust Division. He is an expert in antitrust matters, having served as a commissioner on the Antitrust Modernization Commission from 2004 to 2007. Earlier in his career, Mr. Del Reem has served as antitrust counsel and later as the staff director and chief counsel of the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee. He is a graduate of UCLA, Johns Hopkins, and the George Washington University Law School. Welcome, sir. Joseph Simons was sworn in as chairman of the Federal Trade Commission on May 1, 2018. Before joining the commission, Joe was a partner at Paul Weiss, where he served as co-chair of the firm's antitrust group. Prior to joining the firm, he was the director of the FTC's Bureau of Competition and developed a widely used critical loss analysis technique. He received his bachelor's degree in economics and history from Cornell University and his JD from Georgetown University Law Center. Thank you, sir, for being here. Each of the witnesses' written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. I ask that each of you will summarize your statement in five minutes or less, and to help you along with that, as I customarily do, I will diplomatically grab the, the gavel, and that means that you uh, are over your time limit. So I think you understand how this works. You've been here before. Uh, Mr. Del Ring, please. Thank you, Chairman Marino, Ranking Member Cicilline, and thank you, full committee chairman Goodlad and Ranking Member Nadler, and soon to be Chairman Nadler, and distinguished members of this subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to be here today. Let me first begin by expressing my appreciation to each member 
of this subcommittee, and especially to Chairman Marino and Ranking Member Cicilline, for your bipartisan support of the efforts of the Antitrust Division to enforce the antitrust laws. We welcome your oversight and the important constitutional role you play in continuing the enforcement, the effective enforcement of our U.S. antitrust laws. As you know, the division has a crucially important role of protecting competition on behalf of American consumers. Before I discuss the division's many enforcement efforts and some statistics that you might find informative, I first want to share a quote from the great former Justice Robert Jackson from 1940 when he was an Attorney General of the United States. Uh, just to qualify some of the statistics I cite today, and he said, quote, any prosecutor who risks his day-to-day -day professional name for fair dealing to build up statistics of success has a perverted sense of practical values as well as defects of character. With your permission, I will turn to a few of the highlights of the division's work. First, I'll address criminal enforcement. Second, our civil enforcement program and competition advocacy and our important international engagement and efforts there. In criminally prosecuting antitrust violations such as price fixing and bid rigging, the division pr protects America's consumers and taxpayers from certain and direct economic harm. In recent years, we have obtained criminal fines averaging $1.3 billion through our enforcement efforts. Fiscal year 2017 had a record number of criminal cases go to trial the highest number in the last two decades. Over the fiscal years 2016 and 17, 52 defendants in antitrust division cases have been sentenced to prison terms, totaling over 15,000 days of incarceration. Last month, the division announced civil and criminal penalties against three South Korean companies for bid rigging on Department of Defense fuel supply contracts, demonstrating our commitment to aggressively investigating and prosecuting companies who try to cheat the U.S. government and the American taxpayers. We also used, for the first time at, 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 the, uh, at the degree that we did, Section 4A authority to recover treble damages on behalf of the U.S. taxpayers with, with these uh, three South Korean companies and more to come. Also, the division has implemented a so-called no-poach initiative, investigating and prosecuting anti-poaching and wage-fixing agreements among employers that hurt the American workers. In addition, we have conducted outreach and training for agents at multiple offices of inspectors general at numerous federal agencies to identify, investigate, and pursue bid rigging and market allocation crimes that hurt the taxpayer. With respect to civil enforcement, the division has confronted increasingly larger multi-billion dollar mergers that involve industries important to nearly every consumer. We have protected and restored competition in a number of key industries in markets ranging from crop protection and seed treatments to the nationwide telecommunication fibers and entertainment. The division has litigated matters in a variety of industries, including the more high profile uh, vertical merger transaction in the AT&T Time Warner case, which continues on appeal. Also, as part of our continued efforts to modernize our civil enforcement work, we announced a set of reforms to the merger review process with the goal of completing all merger reviews within six months and most within the statutory 30-day waiting period. And in notice, more importantly, to merging parties that we will aggressively enforce civil investigative demands and their compliance with our document requests as part of that review process. Separate from enforcement, the division is engaged in robust competition advocacy, implementing a wide range of initiatives designed to advance competition mentioned some of our efforts on the consent decree front, but more importantly, we have significantly improved our consent decrees to make them more enforceable, less regulatory, and better be able to protect competition once a consent decree has been entered. With our colleagues at the Federal Trade Commission, we have co-hosted a workshop on promoting competition in the real estate industry, a topic I know is dear to many members of this committee. Finally, on the international front, as the committee knows well, the United States and U.S. businesses benefit from when other nations enforce their competition laws according to sound economic principles and in accordance with appropriate procedures and protections. Our highlights in that area include the advancement of a core set of procedural norms through what we refer to as the multilateral framework on procedures and competition law. 
working in partnership with leading antitrust agencies around the world. Along with our colleagues at the Federal Trade Commission, we've promoted effective enforcement of antitrust and competition across the globe, visiting or hosting agencies in numerous jurisdictions to discuss enforcement, including, just to name a few, China, Brazil, the European Commission, Mexico, India, amongst others. These are just some of the many initiatives and actions taken by the division since I've had the great honor and privilege of leading the capable attorneys and staff of the division over a year ago. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General. <clears throat> Commissioner Simon, please. Thank you, Chairman Marino. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing and doing it in such a bipartisan way. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Cicilline. Chairman Goodlatte, thank you, Ranking Member Nadler, and other members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I am pleased to testify on behalf of the Federal Trade Commission and discuss some of our current competition enforcement activities and policy priorities. I am also pleased to be here, of course, with my esteemed colleague, Assistant Attorney General Macon Del Rahim, who is a terrific colleague. The Commission seeks to promote competition through vigorous law enforcement, a robust policy and research agenda. Just one, one moment. Could you check your mic? Could you pull it a little closer? Maybe we've got a problem there. Sure. How's that? Much better. Okay. So the Commission seeks to promote competition through vigorous law enforcement, a robust policy and research agenda, and international cooperation and coordination. The FTC enforces U.S. antitrust law in many sectors that directly affect consumers and their pocketbooks, such as health care, consumer products and services, technology, manufacturing, and energy. One of our principal responsibilities is to prevent mergers that may substantially lessen competition. Since the beginning of fiscal year 2017, the Commission has challenged 48 mergers. The Commission took action to prevent harm from mergers in a range of industries, from pharmaceuticals to medical instruments, missile systems, industrial gases, cooking oil, agricultural chemi chemicals, and something as mundane as cement. Although many of these cases were resolved through settlements, the Commission has also been very active in merger litigation. In the last year alone, the Commission sued to block five mergers. Two of those ended, in uh, ended successfully when the parties abandoned the transactions after the Commission initiated litigation. Three other mergers are still pending in litigation. The Commission also maintains a robust program to identify and stop anti-competitive conduct other than mergers. The Commission continues to challenge conduct by pharmaceutical companies, including pay-for-delay agreements, sham litigation, and abuse of the regulatory process. For instance, a federal court recently ruled that drug manufacturer AbbVie used sham litigation to legally maintain its monopoly over a testosterone replacement drug, Androgel. The court awarded $493 million in monetary relief as a result of AbbVie's conduct. This is the first time any court has found that sham litigation violated Section 2 of the Sherman Act since the U.S. Supreme Court first recognized this doctrine in 1993, 25 years. One increasing challenge for the Commission in litigating competition cases is the need to hire economic experts for testifying. Qualified experts are critical, and they represent a significant expense in any merger litigation or any uh, antitrust conduct litigation as well. We appreciate very much the Congress's attention to the agency's resource needs, including the need to hire outside experts to support aggressive antitrust enforcement. Last, in addition to our vigorous enforcement work, the Commission continues to use our full complement of policy tools to remote competition. In June, we announced a set of public hearings on competition and consumer protection in the 21st century. This initiative is modeled on a similar effort done in 1995 by the late former FTC Chairman Bob Potofsky. This series of public hearings is exploring whether we need to adjust our enforcement efforts, our priorities, and our policies in light of marketplace changes new evidence, and new thinking. Some of the issues that the hearings are covering include whether we need to change the governing standard for antitrust enforcement, whether merger enforcement has been too lax, our remedial authority with respect to privacy, 
and data security, and many others. Discussion of these issues at the hearings, along with public comments collected throughout the hearings, will help inform our thinking, our enforcement, and our policy choices. The FTC is committed to maximizing its resources to enhance its effectiveness in protecting consumers and promoting competition to anticipate and respond to changes in the marketplace and to meet current and future challenges. One of the ways we do so is by making the FTC a great place to work. We are very proud to have garnered the number one spot among mid-sized agencies in the Partnership for Public Service Best Place to Work rankings in 2018, just announced today. We look forward to continuing to work with the subcommittee and the Congress, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> We're now going to move into the five-minute questioning. I remind all of my colleagues that we could be voting anywhere between quarter of four and quarter after four, so please keep the questioning down uh, to five minutes. And after in-depth consultation, my ranking member and I have agreed that we're going to let uh, the chairman of the full committee and the ranking committee go before us. So, Mr. Goodlatte, please. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, and I, I'll start with uh, Mr. Delrahim. Welcome to both of you. We appreciate your work very much and value your views on these issues. So, I want to ask you about OPEC. Uh, it's a horizontal agreement among various petroleum producers to restrict the supply of petroleum. It's pretty simple how it operates. What effect would the NOPEC legislation have on the antitrust division's ability to enforce antitrust law against OPEC, and how would it benefit consumers? Well, Mr. Chairman, as you have accurately mentioned, whenever you have a horizontal cartel, ultimately prices are not determined by the free markets and uh, the consumers are harmed. Uh, with respect to OPEC, as you know, there's a, it implicates broader issues amongst the administration and in, in, in addition to just pure competition. With respect to the legislation, the administration continues to study the legislation, but what it would do, it would remove two, at least two legal uh, hurdles from any case that the government, should it decide to bring a case, would do. For example, the Act of State Doctrine and the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. And uh, I believe the, the legislation as written, which allows the Justice Department to bring that case uh, would be uh, the preferred mode because it allows for the executive branch, should it de determine to bring such an action, to take such action uh, and would be the appropriate plaintiff, should there ever be one, because of the foreign policy and diplomatic implications it would have. And what uh, impact would it have on consumers and the price of oil? Well, in, uh, I believe, like, like in any cartel, whenever you have uh, an enforcement and you have free markets determining the price rather than uh, restrictions in output that could ha have the potential to raise the prices or somehow setting the price itself, uh, it could very well lower the prices ultimately to the consumer. Well, thank you. I, the, the Congress has spoken loudly and clearly on this issue in the past, and this committee has, uh, in a very bipartisan way, in this Congress, and so we hope that the administration will uh, double down on this and uh, come up with a position in support of American consumers and making it easier for your antitrust division uh, to take action when there are uh, price fixing matters going on on a, a basic commodity that affects uh, the standard of living of virtually every American. Thank you, and we commend you for your attention to this important well, thank issue. Thank you. Mr. Simons, uh, I want to ask you about independent pharmacies being impacted by the anti-competitive behavior of PBMs. Uh, they have complained to me for a number of years <coughs> about a number of issues, including gag clauses in contracts and secret pricing. Are you aware of these complaints? I am, sir. Absolutely. I bet you are. Yes. Uh, how have they factored into your analysis of recent PBM mergers? So we, we haven't reviewed a PBM merger in quite a while, not since I've been at the FTC. Well, I'll, I'll ask Mr. Delrahim the same question in a second, but give us your, your take on this. So the last time the FTC did it, you mean you, you want on the vertical deals that the DOJ reviewed? Right. I don't, I don't really have, I'm so sorry, I don't really have a view on I that. I know you don't, but in general, and then I'll turn to Mr. Delrahim and get his comments on the specific mergers that they've dealt with. Oh, so um, this is an industry that's highly concentrated. That's, that's obvious. So anytime you're, you're in a situation like that, you want to be very careful about 
reviewing the mergers that are going on in that industry. So, you know, without speaking the specifics, and I'm sure they did a very careful analysis, that, that's what we would do with the FTC if we, if we were evaluating those transactions. Great. Thank you. Mr. Delarim. Well, the, I believe the two transactions you're referring to, uh, one is the uh, Cigna uh, and, and Express Group acquisition and the other being CVS and Aetna. Uh, we did take a look at both of those, uh, the enforcement action we took with respect to the CVS matters. Now currently before the court, we demanded a divestiture of certain assets, which they successfully did to, to the company called WellCare. We examined the vertical transactions there. One of the interesting things, I think, in that industry is the fact that you, you have multiple layers between the insurer, the PBM, the drug manufacturers, and some perhaps issues of transparencies of the actual drug cost. I think it, it goes to the heart of some of the complaints. Some of these will now be uh, with the integration. Because there is some competition uh, with the PBMs, we believe that the incentive to actually use it in an anti-competitive way with a rival will decrease, one. Two, uh, a concept where uh, what, what the economists call, in, in our parlance, elimination of double marginalization. When you have an insurance company that has a certain uh, amount of margins and a PBM that also has certain margins, they now have an incentive to be able to compete more and create gra greater drug transparency. So we think there's actually positive uh, reforms that will come from the vertical transactions here that will benefit the consumer ultimately. Some of these are regulatory issues that deal with CMS and we engage in competition advocacy to encourage the greater <coughs> price tr uh, transparency to the consumer. One of the things that has appalled me the most in this area are local pharmacies complaining to me about gag clauses in their contracts with these PBMs. Can you explain those? Uh, I don't know if I fully understand uh, those gag clauses, it was not a subject of our review in the Aetna transaction or the Cigna Express script. Basically, uh, as I understand it, they're prohibited from being able to tell the consumer consumer. that they can get uh, the product uh, less expensively, even by, by paying cash for it, uh, than going through the uh, insurance policy that they're utilizing or vice versa. Why would uh, we tolerate that? As a consumer of pharmac pharmacies myself, I would find that offensive. I don't know exactly the competitive impact that that would have, but that I, I could see the problems ultimately, the anti-consumer problems. I don't know if that actually creates a competitive problem in the marketplace there, but I uh, would want to study that further and see what the CMS and Medicaid uh, re restrictions are with respect to those types of gag orders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time's expired. The chair recognizes the ranking member, Congressman Adler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Chairman Simons, many leading economists agree that concentration in labor markets gives corporations the ability to hoard profits at the expense of workers. It is clear that the antitrust laws reach and can address anti-competitive harm to everyone, including workers. We know this because the antitrust agencies' joint guidelines on human resource policies and subsequent enforcement make this clear. But what remains unclear is whether specific transactions will have anti-competitive effects on labor markets. We have heard concerns that the agencies may not have adequate data to effectively police anti-competitive conduct in labor markets or block merges with anti-competitive effects in labor markets. With this in mind, how are the antitrust agencies ensuring that they are asking the right questions as the danger of a, pot of a potential harm appears? So we look at, we look at every merger uh, very carefully. We look to see where, the, uh, where their plants are located, where they do business, and the extent to which they are overlapping uh, on the labor side. Every, um, the staff is instructed to look at every merger for labor issues for this precise reason. And why haven't the agencies used the reporting process under the Hart Scott Rodino oh. Act to gather critical data for labor markets? You know, that is a really good question. I hadn't thought of that before, but now that you raise it, we are going to go look at it. You're going to look, go look at doing that, right? We can't do it ourselves, but we, well, what I would suggest that we do is we go back and we see what things might be relevant. What could we ask for um, in terms of actually we could, we'd have to do a rulemaking probably, and, we, and to uh, redo we'd have to do a rulemaking I think probably to uh, to change the reporting requirements. But we could go back and look and see um, if some what makes sense in terms of making sure we identify in the Hart Scott reporting form itself 
um, information that would be useful for us in identifying the labor overlaps. Thank you. Now, wouldn't payroll data, <laughs> employment, demographic information such as benefits and other information, <clears throat> such as the presence of no poach or non-compete clauses in employment contracts, be a beneficial resource in addressing the anti-competitive effects on workers in merger enforcement? Very well might be. And are, are you able to, uh, to act, you're saying it might be. Is there any doubt of it? Uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to think about exactly, you know, what data you're, you're referring to, what kind of detail, and, and just think about it a little bit more. This is the first time I've actually thought about what types of things we're talking about in terms of the hart scott Rodino form. Okay. Now, according to a report by the New York Times, non-compete clauses have become pervasive, unreasonably broad in duration and scope, and cover one in five Americans, from hairdressers to engineers. A leading economist, Alan Kruger, has described the prevalence of non-competes as an act to prevent the forces of competition, to rig the labor market against workers, and the Commission recently held a hearing where there was near unanimous concern raised by the anti-competitive effects of non-compete clauses on labor markets. The Treasury Department likewise reported in 2016 that non-compete clauses diminish workers' earnings, mobility, and economic opportunity. What resources have the agencies dedicated to policing non-compete clauses in employment contracts? So w the, sta the staff is looking at this. Um, and what we're focused on is situations where, because under the antitrust laws, this is what we can address, is situations where there's market May power. You, uh, I'm sorry? Repeat what you just said. Um, so we're looking at situations under the antitrust laws, because that's, that's the jurisdiction that we have, where there's market power. Um, firms that have market power entering into these types of agreements, because we can, we can prosecute those under the antitrust laws. But in addition, as you've described, there's a lot of circumstances where um, the company that is imposing the non-compete doesn't have, doesn't have market power, and it would be difficult for us to reach that under the antitrust laws. And that might be a good, um, a good topic for potential legislation. Because it's not clear to us at all that in those situations, particularly when you're talking about um, uh, workers that don't have a lot of training requirements, um, that we don't, we don't really see what the benefits are of the, uh, the non-compete agreement as opposed to a situation where you have a very high skilled labor and lots of training that you the do employer see the does. the detriments and the legislation isn't cleared in terms of enforcement power. Yes. Thank you. Now, the antitrust division has a leading role in the criminal enforcement of the antitrust laws. This includes enforcement against employers for wage fixing and no poach clauses which are per se violations of the antitrust laws because they have no redeeming <coughs> competitive value. Assistant Attorney General Del Rahim, could you explain the division's enforcement priorities in this market? Yes, Mr. Chairman. We have, uh, uh, as you know, in October 2016, the, the division issued the guidelines with respect to no poach. We brought the very first uh, set of enforcement actions, resulted in a civil settlement that actually resulted from a merger in the Kenor matter. Uh, dealing with no poach. Uh, and the reason we brought those civilly was the action had started and concluded by the time the division's uh, guidelines were issued. And we thought as a matter of due process, we addressed them. I believe there was a multiple uh, number of instances. Since then, we have instituted a, a uniform program for every single merger filing that we get to look through keywords and, and we have identified other no poach uh, matters that come to us through the data that we get and continue to do that. Uh, moreover, in the front office uh, counsel to me, uh, we have brought probably one of the, the best experts on no poach who is dedicated and uh, she has been going around not only at Harvard but University of Texas and multiple other fora discussing uh, no poach issues to create greater awareness uh, to the community. We have also have some matters I cannot discuss publicly, but some criminal investigations in the no poach arena. Thank you. That leads to the last uh, very brief question. Uh, I understand the division is currently pursuing several active cases, which, which you just said. Yes, sir. I'm aware that you're unable to comment publicly on these cases, but would you commit to providing a confidential staff briefing on the status of these lawsuits? Uh, we would be delighted to provide that to you consistent with our rules and the grand jury rules and 6E obligations. Very good. Thank you very much. I yield back. I now recognize myself for my questioning. <coughs> General Del Rahim, you have made remarks 
indicating that you want to terminate the music consent decrees with ASCAP and BMI. I know that they are currently under review by the DOJ, and are you taking into account the potentially negative impact on ending these consent decrees without an alternative in place? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have, uh, as, as you have correctly stated, you know, we have uh, begun a review of all of the outstanding about 1,300 consent decrees, some of which go back to are 100 years old. Uh, we are systematically meeting, of course, uh, the, both the paramount consent decrees dealing with theatrical movie distribution and the ASCAP BMI dealing with music have probably taken the greatest level of our uh, amount of our resources. We have begun meeting with every interested party from wine shops and, and restaurant owners to hotel owners to broadcasters and musicians and songwriters. We continue to meet that. We will make a public uh, announcement for greater public comment, and then we'll determine. We have not made any conclusions of what the outcome of that review shall be, uh, but we will be carefully looking at that and consulting uh, with you consistent with the Music Modernization Act, as well as just your oversight uh, uh, role uh, in, in how we proceed with that. Before you would terminate these consent decrees, uh, would you be willing to work with Congress, uh, this committee, and uh, place a commission or task force study uh, to review these, dissent, these uh, consent decrees and do that before uh, they're terminated, even though there would n be nothing to replace it? Well, as I mentioned, we have uh, engaged in extensive discussions, but we share your concern about any kind of a disruptive effect it would have both on digital uh, music rights as well as other folks who uh, use and appreciate music, uh, other, you know, many, many multiple licensee uh, in the community. We will be glad to work with you in making sure you have the proper background and the technical support for an alternative solution as we go forward with this process. It's, we, we uh, this committee, the full committee, uh, members on both sides put a lot of time and effort into dealing with these issues. Yes. Uh, I'm just hoping that we don't pull the rug out uh, before being prepared to come back with something because it's truly gonna disrupt the musicians, the, uh, those who write the music, those who write the lyrics, uh, those individuals who, who play the music. So please consider that. We share your concern about a disruptive. Thank you. Chairman uh, Simons, in 2016, the. B the Better Online Ticket Sales Act, better known as the BOTS Act. Uh, the FTC recently announced that they will be holding a workshop next year examining online ticket sales and consumer protections. The BOTS Act is scheduled to be a topic at this workshop, but I would like to know if you can speak to efforts that the FTC has taken so far under the BOTS Act to combat illegal actions in online ticket sale and bots, just referring to the, you know, the robots to get out there and buy these things up and then uh, jack the prices way up. Yes, so thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so we're, we're holding this, uh, this workshop in March, I think it is, and this is uh, part of the, our efforts we're going through to uh, get educated and make sure we know what we're doing and to uh, uh, enforce it as effectively as we can. Uh, we're, we're talking to, uh, to the state AGs and working actively also with, <coughs> with, with them on this effort, and uh, we're, we're actively engaged, um, and uh, um, we're, we're, we're focused on this. And have you used your Section 6 powers to request information from ticket sellers to better identify the bad actors violating the BOTS Act? We, we haven't done that, but that's a possibility. I'm hoping it will be a... Uh, a priority. I think as a prosecutor for 18 years, uh, we follow the money and you go right to the source and uh, that brings the conclusion to a case rather quickly. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, seeing that I only have 15 seconds left, uh, I am going to yield back my time. And who's next here? Oh, Mr. Cicilline, my friend, Mr. Cicilline, uh, please. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Simons, I first want to say uh, thank you so much to you and your staff for all of 
uh, your hard work with the subcommittee on drug price competition issues this Congress. Uh, our welcome. work together on the CREATES Act and along with the extraordinary leadership of our chairman. Uh, and as you know, the CREATES Act would lower the soaring cost of prescription drugs by addressing delay tactics by branded drug companies is something that I feel very strongly about and I really hope that we will move uh, forward in the next Congress. And I recognize that your commission is on really the front lines of enforcement and I think few people appreciate how hard your staff is working on this issue and so many others. It's uh, my understanding that it's not uncommon for attorneys to work 20 hour days doing, during major investigations and we should all take tremendous pride in knowing that a small but dedicated team of, of attorneys and economists are working around the clock on these issues on behalf of the American people. So please communicate my gratitude to your team. I, I certainly will and thank you for the very kind words. Uh, yesterday I raised concerns in a hearing with Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, that Google has used its significant market power to favor its own products or to discriminate against competitors. As I noted during the hearing, anyone who strongly believes in an open internet should be very alarmed by reports of this conduct as well as the findings uh, by the European Commission that Google has abused its dominance through this conduct. And while I was disappointed that Mr. Pichai was not more forthcoming about this issue during the hearing, it's also clear that Google is not the only platform that has the ability and incentive to engage in this type of anti-competitive conduct online. Uh, and while this type of anti-competitive conduct has the capacity to destroy the competitive process and harm innovation in the long run, it does not always have clear short-term price quality and output effects. Would you speak to how the Commission determines whether conduct has anti-competitive effects uh, in non-price competition and how you make those determinations? Sure. It's, uh, it's very fact-specific and it varies. it's going to vary by the, by the context in which it occurs. Uh, we're going to look to see what is the impact of the discrimination. We're going to identify the discrimination, make sure we understand what it is and how it works, and then we're going to follow it through and see what exactly the impacts are on the competitors and ultimately if it has an impact on the consumer. And that's where we're focused. Is there an impact on the consumer? Thank you. As I noted earlier this year in an op-ed with former FTC Commissioner Terrell McSweeney, there's a growing consensus that privacy and competition are becoming increasingly interrelated. Last week, internal emails of Facebook that were published by British lawmakers show that Facebook's executives, including CEO Mark Zuckerberg, exploited the company's dominant position to harm rivals. Specifically, the company cut off the access of Twitter, one of its biggest competitors, to Facebook by shutting down the ability of Twitter's video hosting service Vine to work on Facebook, crippling the company. My first question is, are you aware of these reports? Yes. And are there bureaus of competition and consumer protection working together in their investigations into whether Facebook violated its 2011 consent decree? Yes. And how are each of the bureaus consulting with one another to investigate conduct that may harm competition and consumers? Because I think that is particularly important if this... Yeah, uh, so there's, there's two ways in which, in which it can have an impact, at least. Uh, one, one way is you can think of privacy as a, uh, an aspect of quality, and you can compete on aspects of quality. And so if you eliminate competition, then you, you've, you, you've, you've, you've gotten rid of a, um, a, a market driver creating incentives to improve your, that aspect of the quality of the product. Uh, the, other, the other thing to be worried about is um, with respect to privacy legislation, which we encourage the Congress to uh, consider very carefully because we, we, we think that's very worthwhile. But when you're doing that, um, you have to be aware that depending on how you do the privacy legislation, you could have an adverse impact on competition potentially by entrenching the major digital platforms. And that's really counterproductive to what you're trying to do in the first place. So those are the two, the two different areas that we're, we're lo we look at across, thank you, across the bureaus. Mr. Delrahim, thank you also for your uh, outstanding work and your great team. I want to turn now to T-Mobile's pr proposed acquisition of Sprint. Last month, we received a letter from dozens of public interest and labor organizations, including Public Knowledge, the Communication Workers of America, and Free Press, raising serious concerns about this transaction. As they noted, within the context of a hearing request, this transaction is one of the largest in the nation's history. It would shrink the market from four to three competitors, threatening both consumers in the form of higher prices and workers in the form of fewer jobs. Without taking a position on the legality of the transaction, I've also raised concerns that this merger appears to be presumptively anti-competitive under both black letter law and the horizontal merger guidelines because the market for wireless providers is highly concentrated and this transaction may significantly increase concentration in this market. 
With that in mind, I believe that uh, this hearing request is with merit, and I hope that we're able to take that up next year. Uh, I'm a I would ask whether, without discussing an active investigation, can you assure us that the division is devoting adequate resources to investigating potential anti-competitive effects of this merger? Uh, thank you for that question, and, and you're right, given it's an active merger investigation, I can't comment uh, much, but I can assure you, not only do we have uh, adequate resources devoted to the transaction, both from the legal and economic team, we've also detailed over to the Federal Communications Commission uh, one of our top telecommunications talents uh, with the, you know, who is going to be uh, over there and providing advice on the competitive impacts for the FCC's review. And, and Chairman Pai uh, and I have intend to communicate and coordinate our enforcement efforts uh, in, a, in a way that is the most efficient way to examine the competitive effects of the transaction. And can you also commit to ensuring that any efficiencies claimed by the merging parties are verifiable, pro-competitive, and merger specific as required by the horizontal guidelines? Well, our, as you know, the, the guidelines and the law requires these efficiencies to be uh, not only merger specific, but verifiable. And, and if there's going to be any efficiencies recognized, it would have to meet those criteria. I thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair Chair recognizes Congresswoman Handel from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for being here today. I appreciate uh, your good work. Uh, Chairman Simons, I wanted to ask you to give us your thoughts on the standard merger and acquisition reviews through Equal Rules Act, the Smarter Act, uh, and which, as you know, is going to harmonize the merger review procedures between DOJ and FTC. Yeah, I, don't, I generally don't have a very strong a view of that, and here's the reason why. Uh, in my view, is a, you know I, I practiced for a long time in the private sector, and um, so I, I participated in a bunch of a bunch of these cases. And as a practical matter, I don't think really that the standard is is very different in reality in terms of what actually happens in a courtroom. But having said that, uh, it would certainly be uh, like good government to to just make it clear that they are happening. The other thing I want to say is that. Um, I think that, uh, depending on maybe the the, uh, the form of the legislation, there was an issue about whether the commission could bring a. Sorry, could you say the door clicked in? Oh, sorry, there was an issue about whether the commission would be able to bring a um, a merger case in the administrative process first before going to before going to court, and that's one thing that I um, that I think we should be able to maintain. However, if we go, to, if we w we should only get one bite. One bite at the apple. If right. we go to federal court and we lose, we shouldn't be able to go back to an administrative proceeding. Okay, great. Thank you. Did you want to comment on that? Okay. No, I think my those are consistent with the administration's policies. Great. Thank you. Uh, my second question is really uh, for both of you. As you know, you have um, some overlapping jurisdiction when it comes to interpreting antitrust law consistently. And what are you doing to make sure that antitrust laws really are interpreted uh, consistently when you do have a situation of overlapping jurisdiction? And well, I'll hear from both of you. So Jeff, We had dinner last night. For. We're having lunch again. <laughs> we and you're here today it's together? Tomorrow. Today tomorrow. Tomorrow. Uh, we communicate. No, the two agencies have learned to uh, work well together, work cooperatively. Um, every now and then we might have differences. I can assure you, even within my front office, we will have differences, but we have an orderly process to address those and, and, and work well together. So you have set procedures and Well, there's a clearance processes. process to determine who investigates which cases. Yeah. So th that's in place and we're working to improve it as well. Okay. In, in what ways do you think it should be improved? Uh, kind of like a procedural, there are procedural issues. We can improve the timing in terms of making sure that we reach a decision uh, earlier on during the 30-day waiting period. Okay. Sometimes it takes, you know, 29 days for the two agencies to determine. Uh, I remember Google DoubleClick, it took that long more recently, so we have been discussing closely to try to, you know, uh, come up with a procedure where we can get that done, you know. And this is, you know, maybe 2 percent of any matters that goes up, 99 percent of them get resolved immediately. Uh, but sometimes th when there is a disagreement about that, we'll have a process in place uh, that will be improved and we'll be able to get that done soon. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. The chair now recognizes uh, the congressman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Simmons, Mr. Del Rahim, thank you both for uh, appearing here today. Uh, America is known for being a, both a place where innovation flourishes and a country where everyday consumers are protected 
from physical and financial harm, and your agencies are tasked with upholding these protections. Uh, the evolving landscape of technology companies and the novel consumer protection consume concerns that they create deserve close examination and scrutiny, and I'd like to begin by discussing uh, some things with you all today. Mr. Del Rahim, uh, sir, you are a quite accomplished individual having immigrated to this country from uh, the country of Iran as a Jewish uh, refugee, you and your family, at the age of nine years old, and uh, you were challenged to learn English, uh, which you did uh, very quickly. Uh, you uh, ended up distinguishing yourself as a graduate from the uh, USCLA, UCLA uh, institution with a BS in kinesiology. And then you went on to uh, obtain your uh, Juris Doctorate at George Washington University Law School. And then you went on to receive a MS in biotechnology from John Hopkins University. Uh, and you have uh, uh, distinguished yourself uh, as an immigrant to this country. And uh, it's ironic that should you have been an immigrant at this particular time, then you would not have been able to enter this country because of uh, President Trump's Muslim ban. But notwithstanding that fact, uh, Mr. Del Rahim, I'd like to ask you, the Trump administration's interference in the mechanics of mergers and acquisitions has been well documented over the past two years. Corporations have had unprecedented access to administration lawyers, policy staff, and even the president himself. The interference of political and special interest in antitrust enforcement is of great concern. How have you sought to divorce yourself from the influence of the president in your department's oversight of mergers and acquisitions? Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Congressman, you, you're very kind to mention some of my background and, and, and work, and I'm uh, very proud of that and privileged to be in this country. Uh, with respect to the politics, I'd say, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Marvin Gaye. He said, believe some of uh, what you see and none of what you hear in that great song. Um, it is, I don't believe, uh, you know, I've lived through it as the antitrust division head and, and on the receiving end of some of those accusations by some of the largest merging parties to try to implicate that our decision and the work that the division does has been somehow influenced by politics. Um, yeah, I think it was a, uh, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a cynical effort as part of a major uh, transaction. As I've said before, there has been no direction and there's no role for politics in merger enforcement or law enforcement. Of course, we're part of the executive branch and there's a unitary government, uh, so that's important to bear in mind, but there has been no in, in influence of our merger reforms. Ultimately, we have to go before a judge and prove our cases. Um, with respect to some of the commentary in the media uh, about that, I, I just leave them as what they are. Many people started becoming experts in vertical merger law and whether or not the antitrust division in 40 years has challenged that. Well, just because 40, it's been 40 years since one has been litigated because the parties didn't settle or agree to divestitures or other remedies here uh, does not mean that the division didn't. And I would refer the committee to the previous administration's deputy assistant attorney general who in November of 16 had a great speech and outlined about uh, at least a dozen different vertical mergers where there was enforcement. Either the parties disbanded or it was settled so with a so remedy. So your contention is that the litigation involving the AT&T, Tom Warner merger was not politically influenced? Absolutely not. And can you guarantee us that your agency's enforcement actions are not affected by this administration's involvement both politically and personally in mergers and acquisitions? I can, I can not only assure you that, we have established policies in the Justice Department, what's called the Holder Memo, and then inside the White House, the McGahn Memo, which, uh, which 
protects the level of communication and the mode through which there's communication on any pending matter. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. Your career has been distinguished as well, and I would be remiss not to point that out as I yield back. My time has expired. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes the Congressman from Georgia, Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Um, just a, a few questions. We'll go uh, over some. It's good to see you both again as well. Uh, Ms. Simons, the FTC, although not being an anti-piracy organization in particular, is piracy presents a growing threat of consumers as a source of malware. Indeed, one-third of pirate sites expose users to malware. Pirate sites are 28 more times likely to infect users with malware than mainstream websites in a longer uh, a consumer spends on a pirate site perhaps unaware that it is not a legitimate service, the greater the risk. And these were studies that were conducted by Digital uh, Citizens Alliance, Carnegie Mellon. And that, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent to uh, include those into the record. Thank you. And, and this brings me to my question, because I know, Ms. you participated in an event with the uh, U.S. Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinators concerning this issue of streaming piracy, something that is... I don't think so. You don't think so? No. Okay. The, the issue is coming to a concern, and, and whether you did or not, the issue is coming to a concern on other areas of how we would combat this in the area of streaming. Is that something that, how? So we're, what we're focused on is how this plays into scams and frauds, right. which is significant, and we're, we're very focused on that, absolutely. Do you see that as a, especially with the, the, some of the lack of transparencies and other things there with the sure. streaming? How can we get at that, especially when we had the long hearing yesterday concerning you know, what people know and what they don't know concerning their rights? How do you right. see that in the streaming environment? So, well, I think this is one of the things that, uh, that the Congress could take up in considering you know, whether to enact privacy legislation or not. I think I think that would that would be you know. Would you see that? Well you know, I, I know it was seemingly popular yesterday at the hearing. The uh, the European standard there and ah. some of the new standards there. So the European standard may be a great standard. It, it may be less wonderful, um, but it, it, it affords us um, an opportunity to look look at it as if it's a natural experiment. So one of the things that I mentioned earlier that I think we want to be careful about is adopting a privacy regime that actually reduces competition. And so one of the things we can do is look at what's happening in Europe with GDPR and see if it's having any of those types of effects. And maybe if it is, then we can figure out a way to avoid that. You know, and I don't think that we're, we're new enough there to figure that out. We've got, we'll have some time to see how that works as we go forward and, and we give us a, 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 an interesting move forward. Um, let me move forward to another uh, area where the FTC uh, for holding a public hearing on competition and consumer protections in the 21st century to consider broad-based changes in the economy, including new technologies, warranted adjustments to competition, but um, in how consumer protection and law enforcement priorities have aligned there. Uh, specifically, um, from what I can tell, is the previous administration, uh, we didn't look and do the best job we could on the, what it was called the roll-up strategies of tech companies. In other words, mm -hmm. buying the companies, you know, roll-up strategy, uh, buying those before they become a dominant player or a threat to the market. How is, uh, Looking at this again from a new technology, how is, uh, are we approaching these cases when it comes to mergers? How are we approaching these cases when they're not necessarily what we would think of in the traditional sense? Yeah, so this, this is actually one of the specific topics of the hearing, which is the acquisition of nascent competitors. And so as you, as you described, there are instances that people could point to where they could, where at least in hindsight, it certainly looks like we should have stopped something. Um, so we're very focused on educating ourselves on what is the best way to review those types of things that are subject to the hearing. We're getting lots of comments. Uh, we've had very good testimony, and that will inform that will inform uh, how we improve our abilities to uh, to deal with these acquisitions of nascent competitors. Okay. Well, and I think this is something. That one, I'm glad we're having this hearing. I think it'll set a precedent. I had a, I did have a good conversation with. Uh, Mr. Nadler coming in, that this will be areas that the both of you will be back with us. Mr. Elrahim, it's always good to see you and the conversations sure, we've had in the past. Um, this is an area that is, I think, changed. It's one of those, if you go back, it's historically changed, but it, all things old are new again. And I think it's also the things that are new are still old as well. Uh, I know the consent decrees have been mentioned early, especially in the music, that it would probably shock no one in this audience to know that that would be something that I would think about. Um, and the concern is as we go forward and how that is actually played out in that micro. I think the, we made a gigantic step forward. I appreciate the help that is provided in the Music Modernization Act that, that passed out, and I think we're moving forward. But I do believe there are definitely some areas that we can continue to work on as we move forward. But just one last thought in, in this area of antitrust in general. And I think we have to think differently, and you sort of brought that out, Ms. Simmons, 
in the way that we actually, Simons is looking at it from a perspective of the things that we can't see. It's not always as in the older days, here's the company that owns the sort of the hardware, the salt, you know, the whole thing. Now we're dealing in the intangible areas. And I think that's going to become the bigger area of antitrust that we have to deal with as tech grows and as some of these others as well, that we're dealing more in the intangible and how they affect even as from the roll up on to other issues as well. So I just want to say thanks for both of you being here. Look forward to many more discussions and what you've been doing. And I appreciate it. Ms. Simons, appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you yes, sir. Thank you. Chair recognizes Congresswoman Demings from Florida. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, to our two witnesses for joining us today. Um, you know, I appreciate everything that I've heard. I appreciate the information that you've shared. But for me, um, the bottom line is too many working families in this country believe that the system does not work for them. Um, I think they believe that the economy works for the wealthy and the well uh, connected. As you both know, I believe there is mounting evidence of increasing concentration and market power throughout the U.S. economy, resulting in higher prices for consumers. Persistently high corporate prices or profits. And you know, bigness is okay as long as big, bigness does not consume everybody else uh, in the room. I think it also uh, results in decreased innovation and less attention on efficiency of operation and delivery of service. Uh, you, as a member of Congress, I'm certainly interested in the uh, health of our businesses, but every day I think more about the people who work at the corporations or the consumers who are affected by the decisions that are made. I'd just like to hear uh, from you, uh, how are anti-labor practices and the possibility of abuse as the watchdogs, as the enforcers, considered by your agencies when evaluating a possible merger? Either one of you can answer first. Thank you, uh, uh, Representative. Um, so we, on the merger side, the staff is instructed that they are to look at every single merger that they review for issues on the labor side and inputs more generally. So they're, they're doing that. Um, we had one case recently involving a non merger Specifically, are they, when you say look on the labor side, I know we're going to call votes in a few minutes, but yeah, so what, could you give me some examples? Yeah, yeah. Of what so, they, so would they, would look look to, they would look to see where are the plants of the merging firms, where are their offices, um, are they anywhere near each other, are they in areas in which um, the geography is relatively limited. It's not a big city. It's not a huge metropolitan area where the choices for labor are, you know, much more significant. It's more, it's more isolated. So look, look for those. Think about like if you have deals, uh, transactions involving uh, companies that have like really high skilled labor. Um, you might have, you might have situations where even though the plants are not anywhere near each other, the headquarters or the offices are not near each other, the specialties that are involved in that company might be so limited that that this might, the, the universe of these two firms merging might be a, a significant part of their, of their available options. So it's, it's a whole range of, it's a whole range of things that we look at. And, and that is consistent for us, you know, section 12 of our merger guidelines uh, instructs the staff. Just a little bit more for me. Oh, sure. Yeah, thank Can you. you hear me? I, I was just saying section 12 of our joint uh, merger guidelines, you know, mm -hmm. instructs the staff to review for any anti-competitive effect of a merger. And I think what you're probably referring to is a monopsony effect where there's greater buyer power for the labor market. And if there is such a thing for that, you know, for that market, uh, you know, certainly layoffs and employment uh, issues uh, become, uh, become a factor. As, as Chairman Simons was describing, However, those become uh, a greater concern where you have specialized skills because the market for that uh, becomes a greater issue because there's a specialized uh, market uh, because there has to be a substantial lessening of the competition for that market. Uh, so it, it, it happens uh, a lot of times. The other thing with our mergers, as I mentioned to Mr. Nadler, is that we do look uh, through all the documents that are produced. These are millions of documents for specific uh, keywords to look to see if there has been any agreements for no poach between competitors, and uh, we enforce that. We'll enforce that criminally. And if we see if we see evidence like that as well, we refer it to them for criminal prosecution. Okay, great. 
Thank you, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Delrahim, I'm concerned about reports of anti-competitive conduct in the aluminum industry. Are you familiar with uh, the issue just generally? Uh, I have received uh, letters as well uh, relating to that industry and, and the concerns you've raised. Okay. Um, since late last year, there have been very discernible irregularities in the pricing of aluminum set by a private rate-setting organization that has no federal or state oversight. That organization, S&P Global Platts, establishes a pricing benchmark called the Midwest Premium to account for the storage and transportation of aluminum to end users. That price has spiked 138 percent since January for no apparent market-based reason. In response, I sent a letter that you just referenced. In addition, I introduced H.R. 6927, the Apex Act, to require important coordination between the CFTC and the Department of Justice to scrutinize potential anti-competitive conduct and fraud in the aluminum market. Um, what is the Antitrust Division uh, doing about that issue right now? So when we did receive the information, <coughs> both some from the industry as well as I apologize, I'm, I'm having trouble. When we received the letter from both uh, from from the committee as well as some from some members of the industry who raised similar concerns, we refer that to our investigative staff and uh, for further exploration to see if it there's credible evidence to open an investigation. Uh, beyond that, I can't speak uh, publicly about whether or not there is an investigation in that industry. In addition to that, you should know that we work closely with the CFTC uh, in these areas of commodities uh, regulation, and we have some active matters with them. So there's a communication both with the regulator uh, in this area, as well as we are examining to see if, uh, if, if there, was, there should be an investigation opened. And do you have any uh, time frame in mind for that? Uh, we don't, I can get back to you on that. I'll take a look to see, you know, where that is, and we might be able to provide a non-confident, I mean, a, a non-public, uh, confidential briefing for you on a status of where that is. Appreciate it, Mr. Simmons. One specific issue that has arisen with respect to the pricing of aluminum has to do with prices charged for end users for scrap aluminum. End users of aluminum contend that aluminum producers have been overcharging them, as as if all aluminum purchases are sourced from imported aluminum. Yet 70 percent of beer cans, for example, are made from U.S. recycled used beverage containers and scrap and not from imported aluminum. I believe that the practice of suppliers of aluminum charging their customers for scrap metal, a price that includes a tariff when that metal is never subject to any tariff, may very well constitute a deceptive trade practice. Mr. Simmons, are you, what are your thoughts about this issue and will you examine this issue and investigate whether having the price of scrap for scrap metal reflect the recently imposed aluminum tariff is a deceptive trade practice in violation of the FTC Act? Uh, thank you, Representative. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not aware of that, but I'd be happy to look into it. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. They've just called votes. We have about 15 minutes or so. We're going to, uh, Mr. Cicilline has a, another question. I have another question. I'm going to defer to Mr. Cicilline and uh, because this is our last uh, hearing for uh, us. Uh, under these circumstances, uh, we'll go until uh, right. Thank you. Thank you. we think we have to run over there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Uh, Chairman Simmons, I sent a, a, a letter to Google based on an FTC complaint filed by 23 consumer and privacy advocacy groups regarding YouTube's collection and selling of child da uh, da data from children who access YouTube. Uh, in response to that letter, uh, which was led by myself and Congressman Fortenberry, Google really didn't answer the questions and simply maintained that children under 13 are prohibited from using YouTube. Um, but in reality, YouTube has countless channels clearly targeting children like Ryan Toys Reviews and Choo Choo TV Nursery Rhymes and many, many others. Uh, with that in mind, uh, I would like to work with the FTC to make sure that Google and other platforms are complying with uh, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act and wondered if you could speak to what, you know, beyond the investigation of YouTube, what you are doing to end this practice of data collection from children, which is clearly a violation of COPPA. Yeah, so every, every time we, we become aware of, sometimes through press reports, sometimes through your efforts, sometimes through our own efforts, um, you know, we, we initiate law enforcement uh, investigations, and that's, that's, that's the primary way that we're, we're doing that. 
Um, we, also, we also engage in uh, advocacy and uh, consumer and business education along the same line. Well, I, I would love to work with you if, if there are l other legislative solutions that we can do to sure. strengthen COPPA. I think this is a very pernicious problem. Yeah, we, we would be happy to work with and you. And then finally, uh, I was contacted by a constituent, a Lincoln High School student, who educated me about something called skin bedding. I don't know if you are familiar with this. No. So it's, the skins are virtual items that become valuable currency in video games and can be wagered on third-party websites for a chance to win money or more, or more valuable skins. And it's essentially gambling, which is available to children. And a real problem, there are websites that are doing this. And I'm just wondering whether the FTC has looked into this issue of skin betting websites that really encourage uh, children to gamble and whether or not, if you haven't, if the FTC will look into this. It's a very troublesome uh, set of activities and I was happy to learn about it from a high school student in my district, but I'm happy to hear that this practice is growing. So I know we're looking into things that are similar to that, but I don't know if we're looking at that specific thing. So I will get that to you for your review. Terrific. Great. And then finally, Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent uh, that this letter from EPIC, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, be made a part of the record, and I will also make copies of it available to our two witnesses, because I think they make some very useful observations. Without objection. Thank you, and I yield back. <coughs> I, too, have a couple of questions from my constituents. Uh, one I just got a text on, and another one I got a call about earlier. Uh, one concerns the price of gasoline at uh, service stations, and the issue is, according to my constituent, is if <coughs> somebody in the Middle East has heartburn, uh, the price mm -hmm. of oil and the price of gas go up. But the issue is when they get that heartburn and the price of oil goes up, automatically the price of gas goes up at the same time, which is not, which was affected uh, by a lower oil price prior to that price of oil or gas going up. Uh, would you consider looking into the fact that Every gas station that I drive by instantly jacks up that price. And they're not so fast of lowering the price when oil goes down. Right. So we, we what have, can we do about that? Yeah, so we've looked at that in detail over time consistently, and I, I, I'm not sure exactly what the status of the, of the, uh, the research is, but it's, it's a well-known phenomenon called rocks and feathers. Yeah. And so... Um, uh, there are, there are some economic explanations for that kind of behavior, but it could also be the, it could also be the result of collusion. Uh, you, you used the word good because I was going to say, it, uh, I'm not saying anything is being, uh, 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 let's say. Uh, and if they're colluding, they should go to jail. And a problem taking gonna place here with the way that's being done, but uh, uh, General, you may have something to look into as well concerning that, uh, please. Uh, no, sh I mean, certainly should there be uh, collusion at, at that level. But isn't uh, that obvious? Mm -hmm. I mean, I see people out there shaking their heads, and if I get it, uh, the government should get it. As a matter of fact, the person that called me about this turned around and called one of the service stations and raised uh, quite a bit of keen with them, and the next day the price came down. Interesting. So with that, second issue. Given the fact that we have a great deal of lumber in this country and we harvest it, uh, I'm one for harvesting but also replanting. Uh, when we were just discussing, and it ties into Mr. Buck in uh, aluminum prices, when we were discussing uh, tariffs, uh, my uh, people who purchase lumber, people who build doors and cabinets and so on, said their prices immediately went up. Now, uh, what say you about that? That's because the replacement cost went up. The replacement the cost expe of The expected cost of replacing their inventory went up immediately. Okay, I, I, I get that all the time, but that's like me saying, you know something, my interest rates may go up on my mortgage so therefore, I'm going to take some action to make sure that uh, I don't have to pay as much when that interest rate goes up. It's a profit and loss thing, mm -hmm. and if it's not, it's not handed, 
it's transferred to the purchaser of that timber to build those cabinets and those doors without having any increase in cost at that time for that uh, lumber producer. Am I right? I, I increase in nominal cost, increase in opportunity cost, or increase in marginal cost, the way economists measure it, it went up. Okay, there's where there in lies the problem. Yeah. We have economists who haven't probably been into uh, a wood mill, like there are many in my district, uh, pulling something out of their hip pocket and say, this may happen. Well, if it's, it's really speculative, the then, consumer. right? If it's really speculative, then you wouldn't expect to see any movement or much movement at all. But if it's if people are really expecting it as a likelihood, then that's it a is answer. really hitting my district, and I'm sure if it's hitting my district, it's hitting uh, other people who uh, other companies who purchase lumber for whatever reason to build houses. I would appreciate if you could get us some feedback on that. Yeah, we we could do that absolutely. Thank you so much. So this concludes today's hearing, uh, Chairman Simons. Uh, General Del Rahim, I want to thank you so much for being here. We could go another hour just between the two of us with you, but we have to get to the floor to vote. So uh, this concludes today's hearing. Thanks all of the witnesses for attending. Thanks people in, in the audience for being here. Without objection, all members would have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. The hearing is adjourned.